No. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, Wendy. How are you? Hi. <clears throat> Sorry, just chewing my food. I'm doing well. Oh, no. <laughs> You're fine. So, okay, I think everything is working. Oh, good. Uh, let's see. Um, Wendy, would you like to pray for us, or are, you, or are you in the middle of eating? I just swallowed. Okay, I'm ready. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I just, Guillermo said the past and, couple prayers, so I figured we might as well spread it out a little. Yeah, and by the way, I have to leave just a couple minutes early, class early today. I just want to let you know. Oh, oh okay. Thanks for letting me know. All right. <clears throat> Dear Father in Heaven, we're thankful for this beautiful sunny day. We're thankful for spring, which is fast approaching. We're thankful <clears throat> that the students on the school trip are doing well and are safe and ask for that continued protection. We're thankful for all the opportunities this school affords, such as uh, this distance learning class and the wonderful things we have learned thus far and will continue to learn. <clears throat> we <clears throat> have been saddened and shocked by the, the things we have read, especially lately, and, and pray that <clears throat> the leaders of our nations right now will not make many of these same mistakes and help them to to do what is right, if it be thy will. Help us as citizens to do what we can, all that we can, to preserve righteousness and freedom. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Your prayer, Wendy. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, hi, Heidi. Hi, Christina. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good. Well, okay, so today we're going to talk about Mussolini and Hitler, the fascist party in Italy, and the Nazi party in Germany. So some really um, meaty, meaty topics uh, for discussion today. Okay, so let's start with an image. I think images are good to draw people in and give people something to think about and center uh, the class's attention. Um, let's reason together here, right? As we see this, this fasis, right, uh, which means bundle in Latin, fasis, bundles, uh, reason. What does the fasis represent? Political power. It's like there's sh strength and unity. Yeah, yeah, political power, strength and unity, right? This is an old Roman symbol popularized in ancient Rome um, to mean both of those things. Uh, anything else that we see from, from this symbol here? About that power, maybe, or about that, that bundle? What, what's the character of that unified people? Would say? I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, I, I, I said, what's the character of this, uh, this unified people, if the, uh, the sticks are individuals and now they're bound together? Well, there, do, there doesn't seem to be much individualism. Is that what you're going for? Or the, the military aspect of it with the weapon? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, well both of those certainly um, would apply very well. Um, I, I was uh, specifically thinking about um, the two other symbols that, that are attached um, to the fossus, right? The, uh, the lion um, as well as the axe. Uh, and so certainly right, we see this, this militaristic character um, of this, this unified people here. Uh, and of course, um, individuality um, is lost for the sake of the state, you could say, um, in, uh, in this representation. So if, if we look at this, right, and, and we relate it, how have governments used fossils? Uh, well, in this particular one, it represents that the government if you bind to, if you bind yourselves together as one unit, we will protect you. We'll go we'll go ahead of you and protect you. Is what it looks like to me. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, and just out of curiosity, do you know of any governments um, other than we talked about ancient Rome, right, that have used this symbol or something similar to it? Our <coughs> our own. Right. Yeah. Um, we we see that there. Uh, is the eagle, right, and in the, in the eagle's talon, right, we have the arrows that are bound together, clasped by the claw, right, once again we have that symbol of being bound together in unity, uh, but also arrows symbolizing sort of a, a military character, sort of, you know, protection, strength uh, through numbers, that sort of a thing, 
Definitely. Um, well, there are many others we'll talk about. Um, about um, one in particular today, that would be uh, Italian fascism, the fascist party in Italy. So if we, if we look at the climate then following World War I to just kind of uh, continue on, um, the theme that we've been talking about for the past few classes, uh, World War I created such upheaval in so many ways. Um, the political, economic, social, and cultural upheaval of World War I created a climate of desperation and confusion in Europe. Europeans longed for stability, security, and prosperity after years of chaos, fear, and famine, and were thus susceptible to the praying of self-proclaimed political saviors. So we'll talk about some of those uh, folks today. Uh, if we look then at some examples, Lenin and then Stalin in, in Russia or the USSR, Mussolini in, Hit in Italy, Hitler in Germany, and a host of other minor sort of would-be dictators uh, or those who ended up being minor dictators such as um, Franco in, uh, in Spain, right, grasped for power and then held enormous influence on the development of their respective nations. Um, Mussolini and Hitler developed different brands of fascism. So we'll talk about fascism today. And, uh, my guess is that by the end, you'll hopefully understand fascism a lot better and understand how there are different strains of fascism, one that we can see in Italy and then another that we can see in Germany. Um, and then aside from the Communist Party's totalitarian reorganization of the USSR, and once again, we'll talk about totalitarian in, in this class, and hopefully we'll be clear by the end what that means, um, Italian fascism and German Nazism proved to be the most radical solutions to the effects of World War I. And so we're going to look at those two radical solutions today. OK. Um, in Italy, uh, following the war, we see displaced war veterans. Um, they don't have jobs. They've just come from fighting. Uh, they're disaffected um, with society. Uh, and so because of that, they form themselves into uh, the Italian uh, Fasci di combattimento, uh, which uh, is sort of these, these military groups, right? Um, and in these military groups, or combat units, uh, if you will, right, they start to pressure government officials to take rapid action against the depression and against all the ill effect, economic effects of World War I. Um, they are sometimes hired out by others who would use them for political uh, ends. Uh, and they, in many instances, act as thugs. Uh, basically organized violence. And so they've gone from violence in war, and now they're in organized violence um, in a country that's now not at war anymore. And so they're taking the same tactics and applying them in peacetime, which will be very important for uh, the route that the fascist party takes in Italy. Well, 1921, we see Benito Mussolini stepping on the scene. Right, He's a mesmerizing public speaker. Uh, he was famous for his uh, clenched, raised fist, his, his jutted jaw, his uh, extreme command of a podium, um, and his ability to captivate a crowd. Um, he became the leader of, of these veteran groups uh, and organized the National Fascist Party. It would quickly, quickly grow to 300,000 members. By 1922, um, he had uh, the most militant of his followers, who were called black shirts, stage a march on Rome. Uh, and this march on Rome, uh, was a bunch of, once again, organized uh, violence and pressure tactics uh, that forced King Victor Emmanuel III to declare Mussolini the new Italian prime minister, so taking power by force. 1922 to 25, Mussolini did a lot of things to change Italian uh, government and society. He rapidly revoked civil liberties. He promoted political assassinations uh, and other acts of organized violence. And remember, he had the group to do this with because they were trained killers. Right? They were used to violence. Um, he became a dictator. He unleashed a systematic fascistization of Italy and promoted the cult of Il Duce. Uh, and Il Duce was the duke or the leader in Italian. That's what he called himself. Um, through incredibly effective propaganda and mass communication. Uh, if you were to have walked through Italy during those days, you would have seen billboards, uh, movies, radio announcements, uh, newspaper advertisements, all touting uh, the infallibility of Il Duce um, with slogans such as, Il Duce is never wrong, uh, a picture of uh, Mussolini's head with hundreds of words that are all the same saying yes, 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 because that was the only right answer when Il Duce, when Il Duce spoke. The answer was yes. Uh, and Excuse he, me? This, go ahead. What does Il Duce mean, and what does Fasci di Combattimento mean? Right. Um, have, you, have you been able to hear me, Wendy? Am, 
am I coming? Am I yeah, coming? Did you... <laughs> oh, most, um... Yeah, most of the time I can hear you. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Okay. I, I did. Ex I did explain them both of those, but I'll, I, I am happy to explain them again. Um, okay. So if we go back um, to uh, to this one here, right? Fasci di combattimento. Okay. Um, Fasci would be a group, right? Bound together, right? Okay. And then D is of. Combattimento is combat, right? So these are combat groups uh, or uh, fighting units. That would be the translation there. Uh, and then if we go to il duce. Um, that means the duke or the leader, uh, and that is the title that Mussolini gave to himself. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a great question, and I and I am sorry um, uh, that, that there was that miscommunication there. Um, please let me know if you can't hear or if uh, anything's unclear. Um, okay, and so uh, it's very interesting because as as uh, he was building up this cult of personality, which would be so important to these 20th century dictators. Um, so incredibly important. Um, he then realized that he wouldn't be able to get the Italian people fully behind him unless he was able to take control of their conscience through getting the church, the Roman Catholic Church, behind him. And so in 1929, he signed the very controversial Lateran Accords, which forced and made uh, official um, Roman Catholicism okay, as the state religion of fascist Italy and then brought uh, the church's blessing upon fascism. Basically, the church said, yes, follow Mussolini, follow fascism, we're behind it. And of course, the church did this under duress, uh, but they felt they had to do it for survival. Uh, and this was a, a very sad moment, because after this moment, we see anybody who had really doubted Mussolini, for the most part, saying, OK, I'm going to jump in the bandwagon because the church is on board. Well. Um, Giovanni Gentile, no relation to me, um, can I say, even though Gentile is my last name and my ancestors are from Italy, uh, but Giovanni Gentile was the mastermind behind um, the philosophies of Italian fascism, um, and he sort of uh, did a ghost writing um, of what is fascism or the doctrine of fascism, which was published uh, under Mussolini's name uh, in 1932. Uh, you've read um, excerpts from uh, what is fascism? And so I'll ask you the question and ask you to reason. Uh, what are the philosophical tenets of Italian fascism? Uh, and as you answer that, that question, uh, what does Italian fascism say about war and violence, duty, struggle, conquest, imperial, imperialism and Italianization, communism and class struggle on one hand, democracy and capitalism on the other hand, authority, collectivism, and the totalitarian state, um, individual rights and liberties, and then the 20th century versus the 19th century. What did you reason from your reading? What would you say? Um, well, they said that um, war and violence, duty, struggle, conquest, imperialism, all that, they said that was, all that stuff was good and that it was important for, for fascism to do that in order to um, expand it. Yeah. Right, right. Definitely. Uh, and, so, and so what would we say then, you know, as, as they're trying to expand, as you said, Walter, and thank you so much for that comment, what, what role did war and violence play uh, in fascism? Because they go hand in hand. What Walter said with, with uh, this philosophy of war and violence and uh, the importance of them. Well, I kind of got that it was what he was saying it was necessary. One thing mm -hmm. to be able to expand, they had to you know, get a larger land area, and also because, what does he say here? It puts the stamp of nobility upon people when they have the courage to meet it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it makes them stronger. I think he's saying it makes them stronger, and it, it's necessary. Right. But, you know, thus it's a duty. Yeah, definitely. Any, anything else about, about war and violence? That's a great answer, Heidi. Well, uh, Mussolini talks about how war and violence, uh, militarism, um, will revitalize a weakened Italy. Um, he's saying that, just as Heidi was saying, right, that we need to be strong right, through being warlike, um, and that true life, really experiencing it, right, you can't do that without sacrifice for the cause of the nation. Um, and the greatest sacrifice is shedding your blood for the nation. Um, that violence revitalizes um, national character. 
that it makes uh, men out of boys, uh, and that um, it brings out the best traits um, of Italians. Uh, and so that when Italians are strong, right, they will be warlike, they will be aggressive, they will be violent. Uh, and that violence um, is a good thing. It, it's healthy for a society to be based upon a courage culture, one that heroicizes violence and violent acts. Can I ask another question? Sorry to keep interrupting. No, that's okay. These are great questions. I, I appreciate them. Um, were any of the people promoting this, had any of them fought in World War I? Why would they, why would they see that as having, having promoted anything good? Or, you mentioned that they were they were unemployed war vets. Were these the ones promoting this idea? Yeah, yeah. These were members of the fascist party. Uh, they actually, if, if you remember, um, those of you who've done the tutorial about World War One, we've looked at futurism um, and the armored train by Gino Severini. Um, and remember how that that painting right celebrated speed uh, and industrialization um, and militarism through uh, focusing on the train. Uh, and the cannons on the train, and the army officers who are in the train, and they're sort of consumed, right? Uh, and so um, fascism played off of futurism. Um, and these people, even though the war had been terrible, right, and it had just devastated the economy, Mussolini was saying war is the only way to get back what should be ours. Uh, and so because of that, I mean, if you think about it, um, Italy really got the short end of the stick uh, because... Um, the Italian prime minister had gone to the Treaty of Versailles uh, with the big three from the US uh, and Britain and France, and he was going to be the fourth. They were going to be the big four together. Uh, and then, because they ignored him so much, um, he, was just, he, le he left in disgust. He didn't even finish, uh, and then he came back at the end. Uh, anyway, and so because of that, Italians really saw World War I um, as this botched effort at their own militarism. They said, you know, we didn't gain the spoils from the war, even though we ended up siding with the victors. Uh, they said that because, of, because the war was mismanaged and because the peace was mismanaged, in, in the Italian point of view, um, that Mussolini said, you know, if we had only done it right, right, we could, we could have been great. Um, and in fact, let's forget about these uh, alliances. Let's focus on Italian greatness. Um, and he said that even though the war had been a disaster, he still felt that um, it in many ways had brought out the very best uh, in the Italian character and that he knew ways to make it even more successful now that they would have a second chance. Uh, and so certainly I, I, I agree with Wendy that I certainly see uh, the, the paradox there. Um, but to these war veterans, um, who suddenly found themselves uh, really without the only thing that they'd known for years, um, Mussolini's militaristic leadership was actually something that they welcomed, oddly enough. Uh, and he became immensely popular because of his organized violence um, as a means to get what he wanted. Does that, does that answer your question, Wendy? It just doesn't help me understand it in the least. I, but, yeah, it answers the question. I just... I'm guessing these were, you know, I guess war turns people to soldiers two ways. We either read the kinds of horrible things that we read last week, you know, where, where they're talking about how horrible it is, or they, they, they come to thrive off of it, I guess, and, mm -hmm. and needed, needed something to fill that vacuum in their lives. I don't know. It's hard to understand why, why war veterans would be promoting this. Right. Well, that, you know, you, you are exactly right because um, both... Um, both Mussolini and Hitler would point to World War I as actually being this heroic moment for manhood. And they would talk about how the men of the age grew up into these strong characters and how they became hardened and sort of refined uh, into men who could use force to get what they wanted. Uh, and anyway, it's very interesting because Hitler, um, Hitler was sort of a, a minor, a minor um, officer in the German army, he ended up being wounded. Anyway, but he always looked back upon his experiences in World War I as just the, the height of his life before he became the Fuhrer. Um, and he saw the, those moments of sort of courage and self-realization um, and just action and violence and power uh, in violence as being things that he did thrive off of. And he specifically wrote about those events um, in his life. So as, as, as twisted as it is, um, to us, and as hard as it is for us to understand, these are the people we're dealing with here. Um, and so 
it's, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to put ourselves in their shoes, but nonetheless, that's what they thought. Um, no, now, it's interesting because Mussolini talks about being a third alternative. He talks about sort of this, this third position between uh, communism and class struggle on one hand and democracy and capitalism on the other hand. What does he say about these other two alternatives? Well, he's basically saying we're, we're neither of those. We're, we're going to form a third way. I always cringe when I hear people talk about third way. Mm -hmm. And it's really, he, he's, he says this isn't about the best way to make money and have the best economy. This isn't about money or economy. This isn't about class struggle. And it's certainly not about um, equality or democracy or having a, a voice. So, um, you know, he's, he's really just, I, get, I guess I really don't get what, what, his, what his position is between those two other than just war and totalitarianism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and one of the differences is that uh, fascism, uh, at least from, from, from communism, it would allow private property in some instances, um, as, long as, those, as long as that private property was used to build up the state appropriately, or else it would be taken away and nationalized. Um, but because it, it allowed private property in some instances, um, but at the same time still had so much state control, it really sort of saw itself as a mix between sort of, you know, a free market economy uh, and then a command economy because it tried to meld elements of both even though it was, uh, you know, so far, I mean, 98, 99 percent, you know, at least, you know, weighted toward the command side of things. But it saw itself as an alternative, um, especially because of what you said, Wendy. Um, it did not see itself as trying to liberate workers by any means, it said class struggle and the economic interpretation of history is a bunch of bunk. Um, fascists didn't believe in it. They said, we are fighting for nationalism, Italian nationalism. We're not fighting to make anybody equal. Uh, and we're also not fighting um, to give equal opportunity. So we don't believe in equality of condition or equality of opportunity. Right? And so they're basically denying the right and the left. Um, as, as they do that. And so, and so that's why he would say, that, oh, well, you know, fascism is sort of more of a middle way, even though, as we see, uh, it is in sort of a twisted middle way filled with lots of lies. Uh, and it's interesting, one of my students in class said, the only difference between communism and fascism um, is that communism told the truth that we're going to take all of your property, um, and fascism lied about it. Uh, and, I, and I thought that was kind of witty. Well, what about totalitarianism? How, how do we understand that word? We see total in there. What does total and totalitarian um, government have to do with fascism? Just total, total government that the state. Control. Yeah, the state will control everything. Right, the state will control everything. And with Christina, were you saying something there as well? No, it was Wendy. Oh, Wendy. Okay, sorry, I, I couldn't hear how many people were speaking. Um, okay, so yeah, so if you think of totalitarian, look at that word total, right? Really, uh, it is the possibility of unlimited government, total government, right? Nothing to impede it. Uh, it goes hand in hand um, with authoritarianism, right? Meaning what the government says goes, and specifically uh, in terms of totalitarian governments, uh, almost always, right, what one individual says goes. And so we see this cult of personality built up around Mussolini, right, built up um, around Hitler built up around Stalin, the three totalitarian regimes in Europe. Uh, and it's very interesting because as they try to collectivize or corporatize um, the economy, uh, they're saying that you don't have any right, individuality that is apart from the state. Right? You can get everything you need and all the individual fulfillment you need right, by tying up your identity in the state. Uh, well, if, if we take a look then, of course, right, government can take away these individual rights and liberties. Uh, let's take a look here. Um, so here's Italian fascism at a glance. I just put together this list for you. Uh, it's totalitarian, right? Unlimited power and potential for government, right? No restraints. It's authoritarian, right? There's this cult of personality around Mussolini in Italy. Uh, there is a single party state. There is no opposition, right? Opposition is crushed ruth ruthlessly. Okay, it's militaristic. It celebrates violence, right? Futurism is its um, favorite type of art. Um, and it believes in conquest, uh, going along with that, right? They have this ideological education, right? You have to brainwash the masses to get them behind you. Uh, and we see that both with fascism in Italy as well as fascism in Germany. 
Uh, there is this ultra sense of nationalism and imperialism. This isn't just, oh yeah, let's be Britain and try to you know, build up our trade networks around the world and build up a global market. No, no, no. This is we need to Italianize the people we conquer, right? the rest of the world. We need more room because we're such a great people ourselves. Uh, and so because of this, it is putting the state first and fighting and living for the state, dying for the state. Um, because of that, an individual's identity is completely tied up in the state, and the state always supersedes the individual. Um, as I talked about before, propaganda through mass communication, um, fascism uh, in both Italy and Germany, it was a, incredibly effective, incredibly effective uh, at getting the word out and getting the people to shift their mindset about government through propaganda. Um, once again, they opposed communism, didn't believe in class conflict, were completely against egalitarianism because they believed that some people were seriously just better than others. Uh, we didn't need to try to bring them to be equal. Uh, on the other hand, they opposed democracy, right? the power in the people. People don't need power when the government's all powerful. Uh, created equal, right? No, 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 we're not created equal. Um, some are better than others. Uh, individualism, right? Don't believe in individualism or individual rights. Okay, so that's why we see um, revoking of civil liberties, right? There's organized violence in the form of black shirts um, against any opposition in Italy, right? Private property or the free market in small, small doses, right, are allowed if they're useful to the state. If they're not useful to the state, and of course the state decides that, right, then they become nationalized, so they become part of the state. Um, Religion is okay, as we see, right, only if it supports the state. And so we see Roman Catholicism all right, as long as it didn't get out of line with fascism, and as long as it gave its blessing to fascism. Um, in Germany, right, we see Lutheranism okay if it supported Hitler's regime. Well, if we take a look, then here's a personal story from my family. As I said, my family came from Italy. Uh, my grandfather, um, who is this man here, um, this is my grandfather, Frank. Uh, and then here is his younger brother, even though he was bigger. This is Piero. Uh, and, and Frank came to the United States in 1936 to escape Mussolini. Um, and it's very interesting because his father, um, Vito, who is here in the center, um, actually had run-ins uh, personally with Mussolini because uh, Vito uh, was a local government official uh, and a banker and uh, very wealthy. Uh, and so he um, had a hand uh, in macroeconomic planning for um, Italy, for uh, the region as well, uh, as he presented a plan to Mussolini. It was very interesting. As, as he spoke to Mussolini, as my grandfather would, would tell the story, um, Mussolini uh, listened to his proposal about how to continue to improve the Italian economy. Uh, and then at the end um, of Vito's presentation, he said, OK, well, I've heard what you have to say, but you need to answer one question for me. Uh, and Vito said, okay, what's the question? And he said, are you with me or are you against me? Are you a fascist? Um, and Vito, who was uh, very much opposed uh, to fascism um, and believed um, in, in the free market and believed in individual liberties, um, he pounded his fist on the table, as my grandfather tells the story, pounded his fist on the table and said, I am not a fascist, I am a free man. Um, and with that, he took his plans and he walked out of the room. Um, and shortly thereafter, Mussolini nationalized his bank, took it away, uh, and he put the Gentile family uh, in financial ruins by basically taking everything that they had. Uh, and so my um, great-grandfather would uh, end up dying a broken man. Um, he would eventually move to uh, the United States and live with, with my grandfather uh, and never had anything good to say about Mussolini. Uh, it was incredibly bitter. And so there is just a little bit of... Uh, there's a personal window into Italian fascism from, from my very own family. Okay. Here we go. Well, Why do people say fascism is, is something that's on the right? In, wh in what sense is it that you might have private property and, and that religion might be okay if it supports the state? I mean, what, what makes this, in any sense of the word, on the right? Sure. Uh, well, this, this right uh, is sort of the same right as the French Revolution with uh, more traditional um, authoritarian governments, right? Because if we think of right during the French Revolution, those are people who supported the king uh, and his authoritarian government. Uh, and so when we talk about right in this sense, um, that's when um, that definition of right is used. And communism um, is on the other extreme um, with the left meaning sort of egalitarian left. 
Um, does, does, that, does, that, does that make sense? Yes, except that communism always ends up having one strong authority figure. Does that? Oh no, it, it's true, and, and and that's why that's why I mean they're they're both they're both uh, command economies, and they are both uh, authoritarian authoritarian. But at the same time, communism um, as a theory doesn't have to be. Um, it really it it, it well, at least it's, it's theoretically philosophically you know it is supposed to be more about the leveling of society. Uh, and giving workers right an equal share with employers and that sort of a thing, and so because of that, it's supposed to be more about the people. Even though, as you said, of course, it always ends up being um, about the dictator as well. Okay, thanks. Well, and isn't my nephew who takes this uh, class down at the college was saying that in communism, their ultimate goal is no government. Is that true? Um, you could, like I said, in, in theory, you could say that, but it's never worked I out that well, way <laughs> because. You have a command economy, which means state planning, and in order to have state planning, you need people in power. But that's the deception behind it, right? It's to say I, that ultimately there would be no government. You'd all be governing yourselves, and it would be this blissful state. And, of course, I told them that would never work because right. someone has to enforce this to make us do it. There's always dissenters. And, but that's the, that's the idea behind it, right, is that that's where it gets the left and right. I sure. Guess. It's always sure. been confusing to me, too, but... I just figure people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, it's in this interesting quote by Elder Maxwell. Uh, he said, Mussolini is said to have made Italy's trains run on time, uh, a genuine convenience to passengers, but scarcely compensation for the awful consequences of his totalitarian rule and the tens of thousands of lives lost thereby. So what do we think about this? What do we think about Mussolini, fascism? What are your thoughts? This is just, uh, you know, if anything could be worse than communism. I mean, at least communism, they're, they're pretending like we're all equal, we're all created equal, and we should all have, um, you know, <laughs> access to the same things. This one is even throwing the one good thing about communism out the window. It's just, it's insane. Right, right. I, I, I appreciate that one. That's a great, that's a great comment. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting here because... Uh, President Hinckley, when he was Elder Hinckley here, this is 1971, um, you know, he mentions um, Mussolini, talks about how Mussolini was of the same ilk, quote unquote, right, from the prophet, or the, excuse me, Elder Hinckley at the time, um, as Hitler, uh, Genghis Khan, you know, the Roman Caesars, Alexander the Great, Cyrus of Persia, Nebuchadnezzar, Hammurabi, you know, etc. Um, and he talks about how these people, right, they fall in the line of those who always, throughout history, have tried to be tyrants and bullies and empire builders, slave seekers, despots, who would destroy every shed of human liberty, right, um, if not opposed by the force of arms. Um, well, of course, the famous quote by, by President Benson from 1987, uh, once again, of course, right, this gets at, uh, at the, the fundamental issue of almost everything in life, really, right? You know, choice versus force, uh, and President Benson saying here um, that, right, the conflict continues. One of Lucifer's primary strategies has been to restrict our agency through the power of earthly governments. And of course, right, don't we see that here, restricting human agency through, through a fascist regime. Uh, well, just so we um, have enough time uh, for Hitler, you know, influenced by Mussolini, it's very interesting. Hitler, Hitler was very much influenced by Mussolini at the start, um, but then he tried to distance himself from Mussolini, and then Mussolini, uh, because he disagreed so much with Hitler's policies about race, um, ended up distancing himself from Hitler. But they ended up being sort of uh, these sort of an, an uneasy couple uh, and alliance uh, as, as, as Axis powers for a time. Um, anyway, but yeah, so he was influenced by Mussolini, and he brought a unique brand though uh, of fascism to Germany. That was one that was based on racial hierarchy. Right? Of course, Germany, as we know, was an economic shambles after World War I. It was hit harder than any other nation by the Great Depression, um, in large part because of its uh, you know, all-or-nothing effort for the, for the war and then also um, the uh, impact of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, Germans, they blamed everybody uh, you know, but themselves for the problems. Uh, communists, Jews, foreigners, um, and they looked to the Nazis right, for um, solutions. Well, 1924, uh, it's very interesting to note that Hitler was in jail when he wrote Mein Kampf, uh, which is my struggle, okay, for leading an unsuccessful uprising against the government. Um, but when he was there, he outlined his very extreme ideology, 
Um, and so from your reading of Mein Kampf, right, what was that ideology? How, what, what, how would you say it was similar to or different from fascism, Italian fascism? Well, he's definitely saying um, the same that, like like Mussolini, he's saying <clears throat> men are. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, he's saying definitely men are not created equal. Um, so that that would be similar. That would be similar to what Mussolini was saying. Mm -hmm. um, only he's he's obviously taking it much much further. Right. Definitely. Any other similarities or differences? Well, if we, if we take a look then, maybe more specifically, right, what does Mein Kampf say about racial purity? What, what does it say about racial purity? Well, he said that we should keep the races from intermixing. Yeah, from intermixing. And Christina, were you saying something before Heidi? No, but I was about to say something. Oh, oh okay. I was just going to say, I looked at what he says about basically you need, you need a racial purity because the superiority of the superior race in his mind becomes lowered as races mix. And so he seemed to think that, you know, with uh, the idea that, that races really do have superiority over each other, that you want to keep the, the highest and the best, you know, the purest. Right. Definitely, right? Because he talks about uh, the results of miscegenation, as you said, on page 26, that the level of superior races becomes lowered, and the physical and mental degeneration then sets in, thus leading slowly but steadily towards a progressive drying up of the vital sap. Um, what about, what does he say about culture? He says some very uh, interesting things. He talks about founders, bearers, and destroyers. Who's a founder, who's a bearer, and who's a destroyer in Hitler's mind of culture? The Aryans, that maybe the Asians would be bearers, and the mm -hmm. destroyers would be anyone of color, probably. Right. Ah, and, right. and probably Jews. Would he put Jews as destroyers of culture? Maybe? Yeah, I yeah, he, and yes. And, and oh, he does definitely. Jews as, as destroyers of culture. Um, and it's true, every, and Wendy, that was like, well said, right? He sees the Aryan race, right, this sort of imagined, imagined race um, of, of Germanic and Scandinavian uh, and, uh, and Teutonic, Britain um, peoples, right, um, as sort of the founders of everything great about the world. They've given the world everything good. Uh, anybody that's done anything good has just borrowed it from them. Uh, bearers are some people like the Japanese, right, saying that, oh, you know, they have their own statism, uh, as it's called, sort of this command economy that was rapidly industrializing Japan, while China uh, and Korea like far, far behind. Um, but he said that they've only taken our methods and just, you know, kind of changed them a little bit, but they can't really do anything on their own. They're not creative beings like we are. Um, and then, of course, the destroyers, right, the people who get in the way uh, and foul everything up. Well, he, of course, says some very inflammatory uh, and just despicable things um, about characteristics of Jews, but briefly stated what, I mean, he goes on for pages and pages, um, right, what, what does he, and, and this, is, this is a small excerpt, just so you know, um, what does he say about characteristics of Jews? How does he see them? Um, people that uh, you, uh, have um, do uh, large amounts of interest on money that they loan people and just people that are just bad and uh, usurpers of money and power and just people that are trying to take over everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, great. Great answer, Walter. You hit on a, a number of important things, right? He sees them as being the, the money changers, right? He, in fact, he even talks about Christ casting out the Jewish money changers from the temple, right? Um, and he talks about how, you know, the Jews have taken over the markets, uh, how they have cheated others, they've fouled up the economy because of their own greed, that um, they're not willing to sacrifice for anything but themselves, all they care about is self-preservation. Um, uh, it talks about how they have... Uh, they have an inability to have true culture, to even speak a true language, because even when they're speaking a language, they're really just speaking as Jews, and they can't really master a language because they can't um, be anyone but their own race, and they can't take on the noble characteristics of other races because they're an inferior race, etc., etc. Um, and so because of that, then, okay, what, what problems does he blame? 
Um, on, on Drews. Well, partly the overcrowding of Germany, doesn't he? I'm sorry, the, uh, the something of Germany? I couldn't, I couldn't hear what you said. The overcrowding? Sure, yep, overcrowding. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, all of the economic woes, right? All of the economic woes, um, starting with World War One, right? That they were, you know, behind uh, all of the bad things that that happened. Um, if we look um, a little bit further, right? He he starts to talk about this, uh, and I'm I don't speak German, but the I don't know Weltanschauung, right? This this worldview, right? That is a racial one, um, and he compares it to Marxism and to democracy. Um, and then he talks about the government of his Third Reich, right, this Third Empire. What does he say about it, would you say? His racial government has a destiny. What's its destiny? To overtake the world. Sure, right? Uh, world domination. Uh, we could say certainly European domination first, um, and as a result, right? This is one of, as I said, ultra nationalism. This isn't, hey, let's just be the best Americans we can be, or hey, let's just be the best French we can be. But this is, no, no, no. We are destined to bring ourselves and our way of life to the world and to get others out of the way. And so, because of that, he believes in this right to territory, right? We need living room, as he said, right? We need to bring all of Germans, all German-speaking peoples, right, Germanophones, together. Um, because we need to band together as the master race. Well, um, it's interesting. If, if we look at these in depth, okay, of course, uh, it's much more than just another nationalism or totalitarianism because we see pan-Germanism, this idea of all German-speaking peoples banding together, right, this destiny of the Third Reich, uh, as we've spoken about, right, this racial hierarchy with a master race of Aryans who were Scandinavians, Germans, Britons, right, lower Alpine races, as he called them, like the Italians and French, still lower Russians and Slavs, okay, who needed to be slaves for the master race, and then, lowest of all, Jews, who were responsible for every recent ill Germany had experienced. Um, he believed in a violent social Darwinism, okay, uh, and this social Darwinism is that uh, there is a survival of the fittest, that certain people ha are biologically in inferior and superior to others, uh, and that because of that, there's a master race that is destined to defeat and subjugate all other races uh, and bring them um, into servitude um, at beneath, beneath Germany, beneath this Aryan race. Uh, of course, there's racism um, just based on, on color, right, against Africans in Germany. Um, of course, the extreme anti-Semitism, right, eugenics, basically biologically engineering German society. Um, and then, of course, the interest in racial purity, uh, so we have these anti-miscegenation laws uh, to keep the Aryan race pure. Eventually, right, he would come up with the final solution uh, of concentration camps, calculated extermination, and medical experiments um, for Jews, Polish Catholics, people with same gender attraction, Jehovah's Witnesses, Gypsies, the disabled, the mentally ill, etc. Uh, so this uh, is uh, Mussolini plus some, for sure. Um, it's interesting, President Packer talks about how seldom has there been on this earth anyone who has duplicated in personality and purpose the adversary quite as much as did Adolf Hitler. How do you think that was so? How was he more like Satan than anyone else? In personality and purpose. I would say partly from his deception. He came mm -hmm. across as this great leader and follow me and everything will be great. And, you know, the other hand was doing something very different. Mm -hmm. I think that's how Satan is. Right, definitely. Excellent, right? The, the father of lies. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's very interesting here because President Hinckley um, compares, compares to how we think about people like Hitler, right, um, to... And how, you know, it's so easy, as you were saying, to sort of follow that, that charismatic leader, right, to Christ. And how sometimes it's harder to follow Christ, right, when we let the world uh, influence whom we judge to be a good leader uh, or not. 
Uh, and so, of course, we think about um, Christ, this, this humble babe born in Bethlehem who did not come um, when he came to the earth, right, with military might, but came um, in very meek circumstances. He healed people. He helped people. He was the servant of all. Uh, exact opposite, right? Um, but yet, uh, his matchless example, as he said, will become the greatest power for goodness and peace in all the world. So just an interesting um, juxtaposition there. Uh, of course, um, we have people who, you know, whether they're members of the church or not, right, if they even can acknowledge the light of Christ even a little bit, right, they know and they cite Hitler as being a despicable person. You know, when people talk about the worst people who've ever lived on the earth, Hitler's name usually comes very quickly. And so Elder Maxwell is saying, see, look at this, right? The light of Christ burns within people, and they see badness. They can see it right when it occurs. Um, and that, that is hopeful, that if we can see badness, that uh, there's still hope for the world, if we can acknowledge that. Um, of course, right, we have all this devastation. We'll talk more about the Holocaust um, next week. And we have Elder Oaks talking just about these slaughters, how that they were rooted in the ancient wickedness of Satan, who taught that a man could murder to get gain. Murder to get gain, right? The mass murderers of this century killed to acquire property and to secure power over others. Hitler was no exception. Uh, and then, of course, we talked about racism before, and we'll talk more about it again. Um, but just I love this quote by President Kimball. We do wish that there would be no racial prejudice. Racial prejudice is of the devil. What Hitler did was of the devil then, of course, by transference, right? There is no place for it in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, well, then just uh, briefly to just catch us up to understand how Hitler tried to put all this together, um, he wanted to overturn Germany, uh, excuse me, to overturn in Germany the effects of the guilt and the demilitariz demilitarization caused by the Treaty of Versailles. He wanted to annex all Germanophone or German-speaking territories into a greater Germany and then take even more Lebensraum, uh, room to live from Poland and the USSR, and then eliminate European Jews. Okay, it's interesting because Mein Kampf was published in 1925, but for five years it was incredibly unpopular. People thought he was a nut, um, other than a very small following. Um, this was in mainstream ger and German society, right? But then, watch what happens when the Depression occurs. Following the onset of the Global Depression, the German unemployed begin to warm to Nazi promises of jobs for all in an economic alternative to communism, because communism was very unpopular. By 1933, um, his popularity had surged such that he led the largest party in Germany and became the nation's leader, its chancellor. And so now things get very interesting. As chancellor, he gained from the Reichstag, Germany's parliament, the power to govern as a dictator by decree. And so he legally abolished democracy in Germany. He put Nazis at the head of all government agencies, schools and universities, and professional associations. He banned all other parties. So once again, we have a single party state. He imprisoned their leaders in concentration camps. He stripped Jews of citizenship, civil rights. He enacted miscegenation laws against Jews to enforce his racial purity that, he, um, that was in his mind. He forced Jews from their professions, took Jewish property. Uh, 1934, he upped things even further. He started calling himself the Führer, which meant the leader, um, similar to Il Duce, right, the leader. Um, and he also proclaimed the Third Reich, right? Uh, the third empire, in his mind, after the medieval Holy Roman Empire and the German Empire of New Imperialism, 1871 to 1918. Um, to the German people, right, the Nazi party worked economic and social miracles, right, coming from the situation that they were coming from. As it completely, excuse me, as it completed massive public works, spurred on business through contracts to rebuild Germany's military stores, and returned women to the spheres of children, church, and kitchen. The German economy made a spectacular rebound, living conditions improved rapidly, and unemployment was lower than it had been since the 1920s. And so most citizens believed that their economic security and prosperity were more important than their freedom. So they gladly followed Hitler, whom they cast as the German miracle worker. So, okay, what do we think now? Biggest differences. Biggest differences between... Well, It'd be easier to compare what's going on now to then. <laughs> Can we do that? There was some eerie similarities in that last paragraph to what's happening now. Uh-huh. Though, though, though I am grateful that we don't have extermination. No, not the extermination part. Just no. being willing to give up your freedom for security. Right, right, right. No, I, I think that's a great point, Heidi. Uh, and I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, you know, if, if we would just take a look here. I, I put these side by side for you. Uh, comparing Italian fascism and German Nazism, uh, what I'd put in this brownish color here, 
right, are really the differences because everything else really just matches up uh, so well. And that's why they're both, they're both forms of fascism because they're so similar. But of course, right, we see race. Race is the big difference and everything coming with it, right? Uh, Pan-Germanism and the Third Reich, social Darwinism, the destiny of the master race, racism, anti-Semitism, eugenics, and racial purity, right, the camps, extermination, the medical experiments, etc. Right, though that's the big difference, and that's where Hitler went even further than Mussolini. Uh, so, to end the class, what are the most profound lessons you will take from today's class? Well, I guess to me it was just so striking. His remarks about the Jews were just so unbelievable that it's hard for me to imagine that this whole country followed him. Did they, did they read the book, or did they just follow everybody else? It's hard for me to understand how they could follow someone who had you know, such a terrible view of, of other human beings. Right. Thank you so much for that, Heidi. What, what other lessons um, have each of you learned from today? Hello? Hello? Hey, can you hear me? I Hello? You. Okay. Hi, hi Heidi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you're still there. Um, well, certainly for me, um, right, it, it makes me think a lot um, about force versus choice um, and just that, I mean, you think about it, force is a lot easier. Right? It's easier. It's easier to make people do what you want them to do when you make them do it, right? Okay? Um, rather than when you, when you give, give, them, um, give them the choice and hope that they'll just choose the right thing. Uh, and so that makes me think a lot about, you know, just so many opportunities uh, as, a, as a teacher and as a, as a father, right, um, to think about, oh, am I, am I governing more like Christ or am I governing more like Mussolini? Um, and, and that's, that's an important question, right? We, we think of, you know, WWJD, right? Maybe a WWMD would be a good contrast. What would Mussolini do to make sure we're not doing that, right? And so we can really try to figure out what we're doing. Well, um, yeah, our, time is, our time is up. And is there anybody else who would like to share a, a lesson that you took from today's class? Mm. Well, I'll say something. Thanks, Guillermo. I appreciate it. Um. Uh, well, I remember the image that you showed at the beginning about the sticks, like, with the lion, and, well, and it makes me think, like, how the sticks are, like, they're forced to be together, they're, they're not, like, together because they want, just, or because they are just together, and they're forced to be together, and then the lion that is on top, and it makes me think, like, in the leader, like in this case Hitler or Mussolini, and how like they they control them and how they force like the people in the that were forced to be together. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm yeah. Thank you so much for that, and I appreciate you bringing up the the fossils that we looked at at the beginning of class, Jen. Well, that was a great comment. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I I appreciate all the comments uh, that you make, and um, I I always love hearing from you. So I just want to close today by, by just saying, you know, uh, these, are, these, are, um, these are unpleasant lessons to learn a lot of the time uh, in, in modern uh, world history. You know, as we look at communism and as we look at fascism in Italy and Nazism in Germany, uh, and we look at what they ended up doing to the world in World War II and then um, throughout the Cold War, um, you know, and so my, my prayer is that we will be able to learn um, what not to do Right from them, um, or if there are instances uh, of goodness that we might see, especially as we talk about the Holocaust and people who found meaning and, and even greater faith uh, during times of, of, of trial, like some of the Holocaust victims, including Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, uh, that we'll be able to try to do those in our own lives, that we will let these lessons affect us. Um, I, I look forward to talking with you more next week as we um, look at the Holocaust 
Uh, we have some very, very powerful readings, some of the most powerful for, from the whole course, I, I, in my opinion. Uh, and then we'll also look at the beginnings of World War II. So I look forward to those classes, and uh, I thank you so much for everything. And have a great day, and I look forward to uh, talking with you soon. Bye. Mr. Gentile, how many classes are we going to take on World War II? We've done uh, two We so are going far. to uh, four weeks, so that's eight classes plus your tutorials. Okay. So eight altogether. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we've just, we've just done the first two. Right, okay. Great, thanks for the question. Okay, bye, Mr. Gentile. Thank you. Okay, bye, everybody. Have a good bye. night. Bye.